So tonight we're continuing on with the, the basics, specifically looking at Hebrews chapter 6 and understanding how Hebrews chapter 6 is actually a picture of the gospel and it's a progression on your mature, maturing as a sadiq, which we, we said is like this is the image of who you are. It's somebody that is a spiritual superhero to bring about God's grace and love and kingdom on this earth. So remember you started out as a baby and as a baby you mature and you grow in the things of God and you understand what he wants and how he wants to do things. And it's a... Remember I talked about the, there's the, the human soul which is all like, like an animal it's only interested in itself, <laughs> in self-preservation. It's about me. And then we have a godly soul, or in Paul's word, soul and spirit. It's simple. So there's this war going on, and what we're trying to do is teach the human side of it to submit to the godly side of it so that you can truly walk in the true who you are. So I'll start this off. I just wanted to define a few things. I teach a little different, I guess, than most. I've spent a lot of my Christian life hearing, hearing stuff, but I'm an engineer. I like to break things apart, figure out how does it work, and then hopefully put it together so that it works. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time looking into this, into the gospel, and wanting to understand how does it work, what, what is it, and hopefully you'll see from a difference it's sometimes it's good to step back and have a look at the big picture have a look at what we actually believe sometimes we look at what we believe when we discover that there's things that are in our belief system that are actually not true a little bit like uh, there's a story going around that the high priest goes into the holy of holies and they put a rope around his foot in case he dies to pull him out Somebody said that from the pulpit once and it spread around the world and it's not in the Bible, it's not anywhere. <laughs> it's just a rumour. But people believe it. So, but anyway, let's have a look. I want to define first what religion is so we can understand the gospel. Religion, this is what I learnt from the rabbis, is I need something from God. That's religion. And if you behave yourself... If you do the right thing, then God's going to give you what you need, uh, usually when you die, but hopefully now. So it's based on a, well, if I do this, this, he's going to do this, this, and this. This is, this is religion. This is not the Christian message, and it's not the message we should be proclaiming. The, what I'm getting at the gospel message, in my opinion, is God needs you. It's that simple. We've made it pretty complicated. So the whole thing about the Bible is because he wants to be one again with you. And that's what the cross is about. That's what Jesus came. That's what the whole Old Testament's about. The whole thing is he wants to be one again with his creation. That's it. Religious people are not good at relationships. A lot of people become religious because it's, it gives a comfort that they have this problem connecting. See, Christianity is not about religion. It's about relationship. People that are addicted to relationships are actually no good at relationships. People that are addicted to religion are no good at relationships. And they're the same category as alcoholics, workaholics, and religious people. See, the whole thing that I see that's going on in this church, it's about relationship. It's getting rid of the stuff, the junk, so that you can truly connect with people and have a relationship and truly connect with him. Because what you need is him. You need a supernaturally powerful encounter with him that will transform you to make you truly alive. It's, it's like you've been, it, it's separation anxiety. <laughs> it's the simplest way. You've been separated from him too much. 
You don't need to hear about him. Well, you need to hear about him, but you need more. You need an experience with him. So let's have a look at the gospel. I'll just go through some basics. So gospel comes from, I don't know whether the, the two words are God spell. And God means good and spell used to be story. So it's a good story. The Western culture has taken the gospel, market, re, repackaged it, marketed it and made it so that it's appealing and in my opinion has watered it down so much. You see where I'm getting at is if we truly understand the gospel, the gospel is the power of God under salvation. It is the message. If you go and study miracle signs and wonders, you'll find out it accompanied the message. If you proclaim the message and you get the message of the gospel right, then these signs will follow the message. God wants to confirm the message because he wants oneness with his people again. He wants to get rid of the, the stuff. We've watered it down to say that if you just confess and believe, you go to heaven when you die. The evangelical gospel can be reduced down to Jesus died to save you from your sins, believe in him for the forgiveness of sins, receive him into your heart and you'll go to heaven when you die. Everyone's heard that one? I'm not knocking that message. It's true. I believe it. But to reduce it down to a one-liner like that robs... <laughs> it robs of what it was really about. See, there's a bit further... We have got a one-liner, but the book of Matthew is how many chapters long? Mark, Luke, John. They didn't have a one-liner. They took all these things. Do you know that the, the gospel is actually not a New Testament idea? That the people in Jesus' time knew what the gospel was before he even came. So when he comes along, he says this message, um, repent. The kingdom of heaven, the gospel, the good news that you've been waiting for is right here. Here's how to enter into it. So they go, whoa, okay. So the Old Testament has the gospel message in it. I'll get into it a bit more. We've all heard the one-liners. Do you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Are you sure you're saved? Saved from what? That H-E-L-L -L place. Make a decision before it's too late or you've been left behind. We've whittled the gospel down into a decision. To make a decision before it's too late so that when you die you go to heaven. But the problem is that it's, in my opinion, it's watered it down so much that we've got partial converts. We've got people that come to church. So we proclaim a message saying, if you believe in Jesus, then he'll make you happy and he, you'll be blessed and all this stuff. But the gospel that I read in the, in the New Testament says that you're going to suffer for following, following him. <laughs> that you're going to be persecuted. That you're going to take up your cross daily and follow him. You're going to have to forsake all else and follow him. It's a very opposite message than... Yeah, he'll make you happy. And the problem we've got is that we've got all these people that are coming into church now and they're not happy. I want my money back. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't work for me. It's like, well, is, is the gospel just about when you die, you're going to go to heaven? Or is it more than that? Because we've divorced ourselves from Judaism, the gospel message is not much more than an anecdote for going to hell and punishment in the end. The reduction of the gospel to going to heaven to escape hell is really selfish. It's self-focused. The reduction of the gospel to just having faith is also selfish. In, in from what I've been learning from the rabbis, faith we need to have faith, but faith is impersonal. It's like, I believe Tamaris is going to cook dinner tomorrow. I believe Ains is going <laughs> to... That's a faith statement. It's a faith statement. 
I believe Pastor Ainsley is going to get up and hopefully pray for some people. So that's faith. But that's not a relationship. We need to have faith, but... Oh, I'll go back to... Faith is not wrong, you should believe, but to believe does not affect the whole heart. It's about to be to know him. It's about intimacy. And intimacy is not just, a, it's a, not just a physical thing, but it's a heart, it's a spiritual thing. It's a connection on a divine thing where you become one flesh, or one in spirit. God wants to make an intimate connection with each and every one of you. Faith is good. I mean, you move mountains. I see a lot of people that just believe, believe, believe for stuff, for things and that. But where's the time spent? What does he want? What's his heart? How does he feel? What's his desire? Because we're back to this whole marriage thing again. Because the gospel to me is about a marriage. It's a marriage between you and him. And a marriage, a relationship works when it's not about things, it's about him. When you're in love, you don't care about eating, sleeping, you stay up all night talking. <laughs> I, I remember I had a guy that worked for me and um, he come into work an hour late. I'm like, what's wrong with you? I've been up all night talking. His girlfriend was in Pakistan or India or something like that. It's like, they don't, you don't care about sleep. It's just like, I want to spend time with you. And that's the focus of the gospel. It's about him. We need to develop a vocabulary about, around to know him. What brings him pleasure? What does he need? The reduction of the gospel to personal forgiveness would be better defined as the gospel of sin management. <laughs> Take care of my sins so I can go to heaven, I can be blessed. One writer uh, puts it this way, the gospel of sin management presumes a Christ with no serious work other than redeeming humankind and fosters vampire Christians who only want a little blood for their sins but nothing more to do with Jesus until they get to heaven. <laughs> these quotes I, I've studied, they, these are from leading theologian, theologians in Christianity have been re-examining the gospel. What was the gospel message? We've switched the gospel to a salvation message. We think that the gospel is actually about salvation, but it's bigger than that and more than that. We have minimized the blood of Jesus enough to save you, but not enough to transform you. He wants transformation to have intimacy, to make ourselves ready for him. In a Jewish wedding, when you're engaged, which is, we call it being born again, you go away and make yourself ready for him. You prepare yourself for your marriage. You want. You're married at that point. Like If you're a born again Christian, you're married to him. But there's two parts to a Jewish wedding. The first part is, yes, I'm engaged. So now we go get ourselves ready. He's coming. He's coming back for you. Are you dressed? Have you got your bridal gear ready? Have you made yourself ready for the king? Because he's coming. The evangelical gospel is obsessed with getting a decision. A survey of American of in America of teenagers between the age of 13 to 17 show that 60 to 80% have made a decision to accept Jesus in their heart. A survey of the same people show that by age 18 to 35, only 6% of this group have anything to do with Jesus. That's frightening. So decisions don't produce fruit. They do 6% of the time. Billy Graham organizations show that only 3 to 4% of those making a decision at one of his crusades are still in church 12 months later. 3 to 4%. That's this is frightening when you break it down. 
Evangelism focuses on the decision, short circuits, and the word is appropriate, aborts the design of the gospel, while evangelism makes to make, aims to make disciples slows down to reveal the full gospel of Jesus and what the apostles. We just <laughs> A gospel that has no link to transformation or discipleship gets you ready to die, but nothing else. In my opinion, this circumvents the whole purpose of the gospel. We have created a salvation gospel culture instead of a gospel culture. There's a big difference. Have, I'm not having a go at anyone, but I find that when I teach the word of God, a lot of people always bring it back to, does this affect my salvation? But most of the Bible is not about salvation. It's about him. It's about a relationship with him. It's about how to relate to each other. It's about him. But everything is like, well, if I do this, am I going to go to heaven when I die? <laughs> because everything we think we do is back again to religion. If I behave myself and I do this right, then I'm going to go to heaven when I die. That's not what we're talking about. That's religion. When you're married, you're engaged... There's nothing in, what was the scripture that uh, no angel, demon, anything in heaven and hell can separate me from the love of God? Yeah, Romans. And yet we're worrying about whether we're saved or not. Anyway. Okay. Anyone who reads the Gospels will find that it doesn't talk very much about the plan of salvation. It mainly talks about the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel is more than Jesus died. It includes his teaching, his birth, his actions, and who he is. The focus of his teaching is repentance to be ready for the coming king and his kingdom on the earth. It includes the resurrection of Jesus and it includes this, his second coming. Are we warning anyone of about what's to happen? You see, <laughs> I can get it. I, I, I see the, the news in Israel and I see the prophecies that are coming to pass. And even what they're saying right now, they're expecting the Messiah's coming back at any moment. They're saying this is the time. Now look at what, what happened in the Gospels. That was the time and most of them weren't ready. They weren't looking for him. They didn't recognize him when he came. And we're in that season again. He's coming. This is, an, this is urgent. This is the time that we get busy knowing him and proclaiming his message to get other people ready to meet the one that loves them. It's urgent. Let's go and have a look at the Old Testament, which I don't like the word Old Testament because it's not old, it's God's word. Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. In the Old Testament, that's the Hebrew word besora, which is the same word bought as gospel or evangelion in the Greek. So here are the book of the prophet Isaiah is proclaiming how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the gospel, who publishes peace, who brings good news, the gospel of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. This is a proclamation of the fulfillment of God's prophetic promises, such as he made through Isaiah to restore the nation of Israel. That's the gospel to establish the messianic king, that's the gospel, the son of David on his throne. This is the good news in the book of Isaiah and this is the good news of the whole Old Testament. The gospel is the end of the exile of, for God's people. It's happening now. The restoration of the people to the land, which is happening now. The fulfillment of the time when God sends his promised king, the Messiah, the anointed one. That's the gospel. They were looking forward to at that time that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to... (laughs) 
I could talk about the gospel for days. There is so much information. He's going to put the end to world wars. He's going to put away your evil inclination. He's going to put the Satan in the pit. Uh, <laughs> there'll be no more lack, no more poverty, no more sickness. Uh, this is all part of the gospel. The restoration of God's people. I mean, we're in exile too. Because he wants the fullness of his presence with his people. And yeah, we're part of them. Jeremiah 31, 32, 33 is the new covenant or the gospel. <laughs> the gospel, if you actually, this is a little bit of a bombshell, but Jeremiah 31, the, the new covenant was to the people of Israel and Judah. So, I don't know if you get that, but the new te covenant was for them. So, our new participation is if we're engrafted, and we get engrafted through a Jewish rabbi called Yeshua. So, when we're yoked to him, we get the same promises. Let's keep going. Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Who does that sound like? Very good. This is the gospel. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of the gospel. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of the gospel, the good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. This is the evangelist proclaiming the gospel in the Old Testament. If you really want to understand the gospel, go study the book of Isaiah, chapter 40 to 66. The whole lot. It's not just a one-liner. I'm trying to say it's bigger. This is John Baptist's sermon. It's, it's a one-liner sermon in Matthew 3, 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there's nine words in the, his gospel message. And now Jesus, in Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus became, began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You don't see Jesus say, do you have me in your heart? If you died today, are you sure you'd be in heaven? I got so frustrated when I was a young Christian because it's like I got told, this is the gospel. And I looked through my Bible and I couldn't find it. <laughs> I didn't see this. If you accept him in your heart, if you believe you're going to go to heaven, it, yeah. Jesus sends out his disciples to heal the sick, and cleanse the lepers, and he tells them to say this message, repent, the kingdom of heaven is hand. So what would happen if we took the same message and we proclaimed it with the understanding I'm hopefully imparting here? If we proclaim the message, then we'd be healing the sick, raising the dead, and doing the same thing because he wants to he wants you to proclaim his message unfortunately I'm, I I get frustrated sometimes it's like uh, I've been in revival and I've seen the message of revival when I seen it was repent it was to return back to him it's leave all the other stuff and return to him and I've seen incredible things with my own eyes happen and then after that I seen people I won't say Christian people on TV saying that repentance just means change your mind and we don't need to just repent once and then that's it we don't need to do it anymore and that message has frustrated me because I think it's short circuiting the message uh, a big subject a leader who I'll remain anonymous he's the a leader of one of the largest churches in America on a TV interview was asked what was his biggest secret to having such large people in his congregation and his simple message was we don't ever talk about sin that frightens me <laughs> what's the point of having so many people in your church and there's no transformation Okay, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heaven 
This is where we got a little confused about, well, if you receive Jesus, you go to heaven when you die. Heaven is actually an idiom for God's name. And I can prove it in John 17, which I haven't got here, but in Jesus' day, God's name is so holy that they would not pronounce it. Only the high priest on the day of the high priest on the day of atonement would proclaim his name. It was that holy. And we should also make his name reverence because the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed or holy be thy name. We respect and holy. So they would use circumlocutions. They wouldn't say his name. So circumlocution for, for God's name would be Father. And it would be heaven or Holy Spirit or so there would, it's a reverential type thing. So you might have heard, oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> it's like, we're not saying God's name because that would be cursing. So we're actually using a circumlocution in this place. So what, the, the, I, the, yeah. the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke actually says the kingdom of God. So that's what, what it's talking about. So, Return. I talked about repentance before. Re repentance is returning to Him. Simple as is return to Him. Uh, or return until Yod Hey Vah Hey, which is the infinite one, becomes your everyday experience and everything that you do. If the preaching of the gospel doesn't include repentance, immersion, discipleship, kingship of Jesus, submission and obedience to what he wants, i.e. his law, the restoration of Israel, the literal coming of the kingdom of God on earth, the preaching of the resurrection of the dead, and God's judgment, it's not the full gospel. But pastoral presentation produces partial converts, not disciples. To me, it's like we've watered this thing so down, I wonder if it has the power to do anything. Uh, I'll show you some scriptures. But this is what Jesus said, Matthew 19, 16, 21. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one good, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. So this guy is asking, what's personal? How do I guarantee my personal salvation? And Jesus talks to him about keeping commandments and earning favor with God. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense because most of what I hear people saying is that the commandments are done away with. They're not important anymore exactly opposite of what Matthew 5 says, exactly what opposite of what the Apostle Paul says, and says, oh, we can't earn anything. And then we've got Jesus saying, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, treasures in God. Where So Jesus is saying the same thing again and again and again. You can earn favor with God. And commandments, <laughs> why do English, English language destroy things? <laughs> Commandments in Hebrew is mitzvot, and it simply means connection. So Jesus is saying, make connections to you, the Lord your God, by not stealing, not murdering, honoring your mother and father, loving your neighbor as yourself. These are good things. These are things that actually help you connect with him. Because it's what he wants, what he needs. Luke 13, 22-24, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who saved be few? And he said to him, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Doesn't sound like the easy path to me. 
this is Luke 13, 25, 27. When once the master of the house has ridden, risen and shut the door, and he began to stand outside and knock the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. There's a, he says the same thing in the end of the, the, Beati the Beatitude, the Sermon on the Mount. It's like, depart from me, I never knew you. This is Luke 13, 28. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but yourselves cast out. He's not preaching a, um, a nice message. It's pretty hard. And it's hard for me. <laughs> it crucifies my flesh. But that's a good thing. I'm not saying that it's wrong. We should be telling people, believe in Jesus, receive him into your heart. But that to me is saying, receive him in an in intimate, personal relationship because he wants to have fellowship with you. Jesus is standing at the door knocking. If you open the door, he'll come in and fellowship with you. So let's have a look at the basics again because this is related. Therefore, leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. See, this is the gospel. Repentance from dead works. I'm going to teach you on repentance, and I've got this really amazing thing that I've been learning from this rabbi about Psalm 51. That King David, through the Psalms, actually learnt, he laid down a pattern for, for repentance. And it's all to do with reconnecting to him. That's it. It's even not even focusing on the sin. It's getting back into relationship. Because he's saying that, I'm giving things away, but to get into depression or negativity because of what you've done is not what it's about. It actually rots the bones, he said there. It's restoring the joy of your salvation. Restoring the joy of the relationship is what repentance is about. It's returning. I mean, this church is about repentance. You've been hurt, which means there's a shield up, and I can't relate to this person and that person, and I can't relate to him because there's a problem here. So repentance is, let's get rid of this so that we can have a relationship again. And there's this beautiful thing in Psalm 51 that is just absolutely amazing. I can't wait to share it with yeah. You get a lot of it. You'll love repentance, hopefully, by the time I've finished. <laughs> repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This is the gospel. <laughs> 